Hi, and thank you for tuning into this video. After kind of dedicating my channel for the last couple of months to exposing all the criminal activity of my former, regretfully former guru, Paramahamsa Nityananda, or I should say the one who calls himself Paramahamsa Nityananda, I've had a lot of people commenting and questioning beneath what exactly I believe in now. And specifically, a few times people have asked me to do a video describing which things I learned from that former so-called guru. Like, what do I still incorporate in my life today? Did I learn anything from him? Do I have anything positive to say at all about my time in India? And, you know, before I get into more interviews with other people who were part of that same cult, I'd like to take some time to explain that for me, like a huge part of the recovery process has been learning to trust myself again and, and really looking into the various beliefs I've carried throughout my life and discerning which are my actual beliefs, like what do I want to carry on with and which things might have been related to the psychological experience of magical thinking. So I want to kind of make this video about my personal cult recovery. I am in no way whatsoever a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I'm not in any way a medical professional. So don't take this as psychiatric advice. This is merely my own personal psychiatric journey. So with that little kind of disclaimer mentioned, let's get into this. Now, Regarding the question of whether or not I have anything positive to say about my time in India, I would like to make it abundantly clear that I have profound love and reverence for Sanatana Dharma, for the ancient lifestyle tradition that is a way of life to the people of India, what was anciently called Bharat. And I really enjoyed every single temple that I visited there. I think that the landscape is beautiful. I got to see the Brahmagiri Hills, which are just stunning. I've seen the Himalayas. I've been to Rishikesh. I've, I've visited temples from Rameshwaram to Tiruvannamalai to Madurai to Varanasi. And, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for the darshans or for the ability to see divinity in those physical places. What I don't kind of enjoy when I look back at my memories of India is the painful mind control and the indoctrination done to me and to my friends by that fraud Nithi who calls himself Nityananda. Excuse me, my nose is dripping a bit because I'm sitting by the window. Oh, and for those who don't know, this is my cat. Her name is Cleo, but I call her Minu because she's so little and Minu, Minu. And she's actually sitting in the chair that I was going to sit on for this video, but I'm the type of animal lover who will sooner sit on the floor next to a chair than make a cat move because, well, isn't she just so cute? Anyhow, um, the mind control tactics. I mean, even pointing out the cuteness of a cat is something I want to mention here because that fraud guru used to tell people that having a pet is a form of lust and that it's a pattern and he actually said there cannot be any type of actual love between an individual and an animal and he said you know people who have dogs and cats are pathetic he was really pet shaming and he encouraged people instead of having pets to have deities murtis like statues of the gods and goddesses and he called those conscious pets. And he said, you know, if you want to love something, if you want to take care of something, instead of taking care of a low consciousness animal that's going to drag you down, instead you should be worshiping a god or a goddess. And in that sense, it's like he was trying to strip us away from our natural human instinct, which is to bond with other creatures and to feel affinity with other creatures. Sorry, Minu, no offense. So one of the things that I've dropped from, you know, my time with him is this false understanding that, you know, the care and compassion for other beings is a form of lust. And I think it, if anything, it speaks to his level of consciousness or his level of intellect 
that he couldn't understand the actual sweetness that it can, ex can exist when we care for other creatures. Um, you know, there, there are lots of people talking about seeing how the cows in his Goshala were underfed, which I find truly sickening in retrospect, um, because I used to promote that place as being compassionate for animals, because that's what I believed it was at the time. Um, I, you know, I've heard people describe seeing his Gurukul kids taking instruction to literally beat street dogs that came into the, the compound. And I think maybe if he had focused more of his attention on, you know, compassion. Today is World Compassion Day, by the way, so happy World Compassion Day. You know, if he had focused more on actual compassion instead of just paying lip service to compassion in a self-serving way, he might have understood the bond that exists between people and their pets instead of shaming it. But anyhow, the mind control and the indoctrination that went on there happened in such a subtle way because a lot of us believed that instead of trying to take over our inner space and control our thoughts and you know control our inner narrative about life, we believed that he was raising our consciousness and making us more integrated and more authentic and more responsible and helping us enrich the world. And so I'd like to start with that. And I mean, I might make this into a series of videos about other teachings of his, but today I want to focus specifically on what he called air. And he said, we need air to live, we need air to breathe. And what he was referring to by air was authenticity, integrity, responsibility, and enriching. Now, for those of you who have done your research about cultic groups and cultic thinking, you might think that I'm describing the group called Landmark, which is kind of a, I think a subsidiary, Chris Shelton told me it, it was somehow, um, it comes out of Scientology. But in fact, this Landmark teaching was brought to Nityananda by a lady who joined his organization shortly after his sex scandal and after he was released from prison. You know, he kind of shuffled out all of his old devotees who dropped him because of that scandal and brought in a new influx of people. I was kind of part of that group. And he told us that we were going to recreate his sangha, recreate his team. And so there was a lady, he gave her the name Ma Manisha, and she previously had been fairly high in the Landmark organization. She was an, ins an instructor for Landmark. And so she brought Nityananda, authenticity, integrity, responsibility, and enriching. And for those of you who look back to, you know, maybe a decade ago, that's when Niti started boasting that these are the four tatwas. Now, tatwa in Sanskrit is a genuine, it's, a, it's an actual ancient Hindu concept or understanding of a way of life, you know, a, a positive way to exist that your existence contributes to others around you. These four tattvas or, or four thought principles or behavioral principles, they are really, really good and beneficial conceptually. And so what Nityananda taught in his videos is authenticity, meaning being true to yourself, integrity, which means keeping your word, being integrated to time. You know, if you say you're going to be somewhere at a certain time, you're there. You don't, you don't show up late. You don't back down on your promise. You know, authenticity to yourself, integrity to your word, responsibility towards your commitments and your dharma, like your personal path in life, what you're here for, being responsible to see it through to its completion. Now, a lot of people kind of start a project but don't finish it, or they take on a job and then they give up halfway. Um, I know a lot of people will set a New Year's resolution and then they don't really fulfill it. Well, that has to do with your integrity to yourself. Your responsibility is predominantly towards other people. So how responsible are you to keep your promises? And then enriching 
is like that special something that you add to the world that's uniquely your contribution. So for an artist, they might enrich the world with their performance skills or with their visual artwork or, or with the music they make. Or if it's somebody who's a YouTuber, it might be something entertaining that you upload for other people. And it's very good. We basically feel stifled in life if we're not creatively contributing something. At least for me personally, I would feel stifled if I didn't think that I was at least adding something interesting to people, whether it's like the jewelry that I make, giving somebody that boost of, you know, excitement to put something new into their wardrobe, or, you know, it's one of my paintings behind me. I really have fun painting canvases and, and putting these up. And actually before I met that fraud guru, my goal in life was to be an artist. Anyhow, on the surface, A-I-R-E, authenticity, integrity, responsibility, and enriching are great. And I've actually heard from people who did these landmark courses that, you know, they found these particular teachings beneficial. But what's unfortunate about the cult of Nityananda is that when you actually start surrendering to him, these concepts or these teachings become a loaded language. And loaded language is something really unique to cultic groups and, and something basically shared across the board among all of these cultic groups that keeps people entrenched in a group think mentality that is very self-serving to the guru and that puts the practitioner in a subservient position to the group guru. So while, you know, in life, I still practice authenticity, integrity, responsibility, and enriching, I still consider these four tatwas part of my core value in life. I do not practice them in the submissive sense that a Nityananda disciple would. And I want to explain the difference here between authenticity, integrity, responsibility, and enriching as per the real world versus these concepts as per Nityananda's loaded language. So while authenticity means being true to ourself, the moment somebody signs away their right to critical thinking and starts surrendering to Nityananda, authenticity shifts from the unique personal self-expression to being authentic to the guru. And what that means is, for example, Nityananda declared one day, all of his disciples have to be bisexual. So if your authentic identity is straight or gay or transgender or whatever else it might be, the moment Nityananda says his disciples have to be transgender, or sorry, have to be bisexual, you throw away your unique identity and replace it with something that he dictates whether or not that's true to you. So personally speaking, I have never been sexually attracted to another female, ever. I am completely straight. And suddenly I was having kind of an identity crisis as his disciple because he told me personally and he told all of us collectively that to be his disciples, we had to be bisexual. And I mean, I've had messages in my inbox from gay friends of mine who said, well, crap, I guess I'm bi. You know, I, I never thought I was, but I guess I am. And more problematically, Nityananda used this bisexual instruction in order to prey on his male disciples. And I mean, I've mentioned in previous videos that I know guys who have been targeted by Nithi for his sexual predatory behavior. Please guys, come out to the public. People are getting impatient waiting to hear your story, so there's that. But anyhow, authenticity, when you are true to yourself, you feel so free about existence because you're not lying to yourself, you're not lying to others, you're not thinking one thing, doing something else, yearning for something else. But the moment your authenticity shifts, from having its inner access, access point within you to revolving around another person, when that other person changes the rules, 
It's like your entire identity is unstable. Now, some people have told me that we should be grateful to the guru even after you leave because look how much he contributed to you. I can say just on the point of authenticity alone, he did not contribute anything to me. In fact, he took away my self-sovereignty and replaced it with a bunch of confusion and his own narcissistic idea of who I should have been in relation to serving him. So authenticity to him means you are no longer your own sovereign being. You now become somebody else's indentured servant. And I know that's a big word here. Indentured servant usually refers to a slave who has to work to pay off the price their slave owner bought them with. But let me explain how that comes into the equation within Nithyananda's spiritual organization. So he claims to be the only living avatar purusha, the only mahavatar or the only purnavatar on the planet right now. What that means in English is that he believes himself to be, or he describes himself as the only living being who is 100% filled with the entirety of the cosmos. So he describes that his body is basically filled with the entirety of the universe. Now he claims that every single god and goddess in the Hindu pantheon have taken residence within him physically. And so when we are quote unquote blessed with physical proximity to him, he claims that we are in effect in the presence of all the gods and goddesses. Now he says that being around a true avatar is the rarest privilege given to any human being ever in history and that it's the most precious thing that we can have in life. So what happens is that by him constantly telling his followers how lucky they are to be his followers and you know how much he has reduced himself from the entire vastness of existence into one human body, he makes it sound like he has sacrificed everything for them. And he'll describe his sex scandal as being religious persecution. He will describe being called a cult leader as being the victim of religious hate speech. And so he makes all of them feel so sorry for him, like a really good narcissist martyr, so that they feel they owe him everything because they believe he is giving them everything. And so when he says that having authenticity to the guru is the only thing the guru asks of the disciple, the disciples hear that loaded language and feel as if giving up their entire identities in favor of picking up the identity he prescribes for them, they think it's a small thing and they don't realize how much they're losing. So another one of his teachings, he claimed that you cannot be violated. And he made all of us, and I say us because at that time I was a very sincere disciple of his. I did everything he told me to. He made us rewatch a discourse where he said, you cannot be violated five times to really drum it into our inner space. And then he gave us as a mantra, the English words, I can never be violated. And he says, anything that you think is violating you, you have given it your permission on a conscious level, even if you don't realize it intellectually, you have given it permission to violate you. And I'll never forget seeing a Q&A session about this. One of his Inner Awakening participants, a program that he does in India, said to him, you know, Swamiji, because that's what we called him, even though he's more like a scammy sleaze, we called him Swamiji, honorifically. That lady said, you know, Swamiji, what about rape victims? What about people who have been sexually violated, physically assaulted, and a man forces himself on her? And he actually said, it might be hurtful for her to hear this, but she gave conscious permission for that to happen. And other people asked, what about victims of murder? And he said, no, they are not violated. On some level, they gave their permission for that. By convincing people that they can never be violated, he is breaking down their defense mechanisms and he is making them feel 
completely like everything bad that ever happened to them in life is their fault. And so it's really making victims feel as if they are their own assaulters. They are their own attackers because they can't believe that somebody violated them. Now this teaching could be something good as far as coming to terms with a past hurt and really finding the strength to move on. But personally speaking, my feeling is that nothing that happened to you is your fault ever. You know, if you're walking down the street and a bird shits on your head, you did not consciously ask that bird to take a dump on you. Like it's, and I speak from experience, I've had birds crap on me long, long time ago when I was a kid. And you know, having somebody say that anything that happens to you, you've asked for it. That is really ridiculous. What is up to you is how you deal with what was done to you. So for example, back when I was in junior high and one day on the school swim day, a bird seagull flying over the field literally shot on my head. If I sat there thinking, how have I asked for this experience to happen? You know, in what way did I give my conscious permission to that bird to do this? That would be such a freaking waste of time. And it would be you know, an endless search because I would never find how I gave permission for that to happen. Instead, deciding to be responsible for the outcome of the event on me meant I quickly ran home. Luckily, I lived close to the school, grabbed my shampoo, washed my hair in the sink, dried it and went back again. And so what I believe personally, and it's so good to be able to say what I believe instead of Swamiji tells us, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what I believe is that when bad things happen to you, it's not your fault. But how you integrate those or reject those as your self experience, that is up to you completely. So if somebody assaults you, you did not ask them to be a victim. But whether you seek justice because you don't want that assailant to ever attack somebody else again, or whether you forget about it and try to ignore it and move on and inwardly you're stewing about it, or whether you in turn get aggressive and want to dominate others because you feel like you don't want to be a victim so it's better to be you know, an attacker, that is your choice. So you do not ask for bad things to happen to you, but you basically create your own future by the decisions you make and the actions you take after the abuse. Now, Nityananda's teachings really fill people with all kinds of confusion and instead of being able to deal with their problems they start self-blaming they start blaming other people for the things bad in their lives and they become dependent on their teacher their master for answers and for solutions authenticity to him means you no longer have an opinion about anything you know, I went vegan when I was 13 years old because I am an animal rights activist. After years of being really proud of my veganism, I actually let this man dictate that vegetarianism is healthier and that dairy should be drunk. And what's interesting is one of the first times I saw him guzzling whole fat milk, I was really sickened because you know, to me, milk is meant for a calf, not for a human body. And I was thinking, how can this man be, you know, a spiritual superior being if he's guzzling milk that was intended for a calf? And then later, I actually beat myself up over that, thinking, how dare I have such an evil thought about him? We are entitled to our opinions. Now, if you're a milk drinker, I'm sorry, I'm not disgusted by you. I don't think that you're a bad person. I just personally believe that dairy is meant for the calf. And I'm vegan again. And that's my own personal authenticity. That's part of my own expression. I think it's really weird that I was so surrendered to somebody else that even my core values and core beliefs about myself, that I'm a straight female, that I'm vegan, that I'm an artist and that I love doing abstract paintings, those things started to drop away because he described sitting and painting as a selfish act. You know, there are bigger, more important things to do, like getting people to pay for his programs. So anyhow, authenticity. In actual reality, being authentic to you is a great way to live your life. But in cult speak, 
in his loaded language way, authenticity to him means completely scrapping all the things you love about yourself and replacing them with his instructions, whether you like it or not, and then pretending that you like it because that's what you think is the right thing to do. After authenticity comes integrity. Now again, integrity for what it really actually is, it's a wonderful, noble quality. You know, none of us want to be that person who makes a coffee date with a friend and then shows up 15 minutes later and finds out that our friend was really annoyed because they had other things they could have been doing or places to go. None of us want to lose our job because we show up late to work. Having integrity to fulfill our commitments and to be where we're supposed to be on time, that's wonderful. But again, in the loaded language of Nityananda doublespeak, integrity is to the guru. Now what he means by integrity is following his routines. He made his sleep deprived disciples show up to 4 a.m. yoga, even if he kept them up in a meeting until 2 a.m. Now he himself was never there for the morning routine because he would sleep all day and I've personally seen it but he demanded perfection from his subservience while not really fulfilling any kind of integrity to anybody himself because he claimed that when he's asleep, he's ruling over all the multiverse. So having integrity to him in his cult meant being there for 4 a.m. yoga, getting ready for the day in one hour really quickly between yoga and puja, then being there for puja, which is a beautiful, Puja itself is a beautiful Hindu worship ceremony to honor divinity. Puja in his cult means worshiping him. You get a little metal pair of padukas that are symbolic of his feet. And then through various physical rituals like offering incense, offering food, offering water while chanting mantras of loyalty and obedience to him, you are symbolically offering your entire self to the feet of your guru. Now, in ancient Hinduism, and even in modern day Hinduism, this can be a beautiful thing if you are surrendering your patterns and your identity to a benevolent force that is going to have your best interest at heart. But in his case, he wants to take all of everything that you have, bleed you dry, in order to serve his own greed. Now. After yoga and then puja, people had to watch his discourse, his satsang. What's interesting is that I read a really awesome book called The Mind Control Manual. After I got out of that cult, after seeing Leah Remini's series, Scientology in the Aftermath, and really waking up to the fact that my entire life had been usurped by a destructive cult organization and by a narcissistic, psychopathic teacher, I read this book, Mind Control Manual, and within it, the psychologist who did the research described that the most receptive people to brainwashing are people who are sleep deprived, who are then physically exhausted through doing physical exercise, who have done some form of meditative practice to put themselves into a different kind of a theta wave thinking pattern. When somebody is in a meditative state, physically exhausted and having done some kind of manual work, anything you tell them, they're likely to immediately integrate it into their belief system because their minds are not working rationally and critically. The, the critical thought process has been turned off. Now, by making sleep deprived people do heavy yoga and then chant repetitive words of subservience to him and then giving the daily discourse in the form of satsang, what the man who called himself Nityananda was essentially doing was creating a really systematic foolproof guaranteed to work system of controlling the minds of all of his followers. Now it's interesting because I've mentioned this in previous videos how we were all sleep deprived and how a lot of people in his cult were overworked through really intensive manual labor. 
and how he forced people as a priority over eating or drinking to listen to his discourse. Doesn't matter if somebody hadn't eaten for a couple of days because they were grinding away in his sacred arts work camp. It didn't matter to him. They still had to do yoga, puja, and hear his discourse. And what's really crazy is that recently somebody shared with me a transcript of one of his recent discourses where he said, integrity to the guru means even if you've missed your sleep, your water, and your meals, you will not miss your Nitya Puja. What he's ultimately saying is, even if you're being you know, brought to the worst space of ill health through sleep deprivation and dehydration and malnutrition, you're still going to worship the feet of the person who is depriving you of sleep, depriving you of water, and depriving you of food. It means integrity to him is completely casting aside everything that is good for you to sustain your health in order to submit yourself to the authority of somebody else who wants something from you. Now, according to the Sri Guru Gita, one of the ancient Sanskrit texts, the authentic guru is the one who does not ask anything from the disciple, but freely gives bliss and consciousness and enlightenment to the disciple. What Nityananda is doing is the opposite. He is asking for huge cash donations. He puts a huge price tag on his programs. He asks for submissiveness. He asks for everything from the disciple. And in return, what does he give? Still waiting to find out. He gives shit all basically. He gives instructions and rules and regulations and crazy ideas like you have to be bisexual and you can't eat broccoli, which that one still puzzles me. So anyhow, authenticity and integrity in real life are wonderful. It means expressing yourself and fulfilling the commitments you give others. Responsibility, the third of his so-called tatwas stolen right from the teachings of Landmark. Responsibility means living your dharma. So for, for each one of us, there's kind of a goal of life that we've set for ourselves. You know, some people choose to become teachers, some choose to become entrepreneurs, somebody might be a real estate agent, somebody else might be an opera singer. Responsibility means feeling like it is up to you to become a success. You don't expect a handout from anybody else. You don't expect no work and lots of pay. You know that you have to work towards your achievements in order to achieve them. Responsibility also means having the presence of mind and the clarity to decide to do what's best for others around you. Living with responsibility. Basically, if you're walking down the street and there's a car speeding towards you and you're in the crosswalk and you know you have the right of way. And so you think, well, forget that driver. I have the right to be here. And so you stand your ground. If the car hits you, responsibility means you understand you should have moved even though that person was in the wrong because it's your responsibility to make sure that you succeed wherever you have the choice that that is. Responsibility to yourself means not waiting for somebody else to give you what's due. It means kind of grabbing life with both hands and doing what's needed. Responsibility to others similarly means if you see a way that you can help somebody else achieve their goals or if you see that you can make somebody else, you know, get the best of a situation, you help them with that. If you've got a friend who's struggling with their weight and doesn't understand why they keep packing on the pounds, and then you see that friend pouring like five tablespoons of olive oil on their salad, responsibility means telling them, hey, do you know the calorie count in that olive oil? Maybe if you limit it down to just half a tablespoon and add some more lemon juice, that'll be healthier. Responsibility means where you can make a difference, make a difference. For me, again, responsibility, I love animals. I don't want animals to suffer. I care about the environment. I don't want the earth to deteriorate. Well, earth itself could never deteriorate, but I don't want the ecosystems on earth to deteriorate. And so I take responsibility by being vegan. I care about other people. So I donate towards the charities that contribute to the people I care about. 
For somebody in the Nityananda cult, however, responsibility means taking responsibility for his mission. And what is his mission? Well, his mission is to get rich and escape a rape trial. But he tells people it's his mission to build temples, to build a Vedic library, to revive the sacred Sanatana Dharma tradition. He claims that when people give money to him, he is using that to build a school, to build a Vedic hospital that has both allopathy and also Siddha and Ayurveda medicine. I thought that was awesome. I still do think if somebody did that, it would be awesome. But he is not doing that. Now, when people live with responsibility in his loaded language way of speaking, he makes them declare that they are going to do huge things to serve him. And then he holds them to it. And when they fail at that, it gives him an ironclad reason to be mad at them, to yell at them, to belittle them, to bully them, to punish them. An example of this would be in the interview I did with Jasmine Glow, who used to be Manithya Vibhuti and who was later Manithya Priya Surupananda. She mentioned that while she was living as the Mahant of the country of Slovakia, he would make her declare ridiculous numbers of people who she would bring to his inner awakening programs or his December programs, these crazy overpriced ten to $16,000 a person programs. Now she's told me that Slovakia, the average person's annual income is something around $30,000. So a $16,000 program is more than half of a person's annual income in her country. It's not realistic. And yet he would make her declare that she will bring 500 people to each program. And then when in fact she brought say 10 to 15, which is still a wonderful achievement, instead of giving her positive reinforcement and congratulating her on bringing anybody to those programs, he would yell at her and berate her and tell her that she's not being responsible, that she's failing her responsibility. I remember once I was actually staying with her in Slovakia and he was planning this ridiculous world tour that he never actually went on. And he sent instructions to her to build a stage in the venue hall and told her, take responsibility, make it happen. One of his favorite things to say to people when he gives them an impossible task is make it happen. And she showed me these diagrams for the stage she was supposed to build. And it looked like, imagine if you're given like a 50 page Ikea instruction manual, but you don't have any of the Ikea pieces. Like how are you supposed to build this apothecary desk? from the Ikea manual if you don't have the set of stuff that goes with it, right? So this, this stage required something along the lines of 400 pieces. She didn't have any of them. And when she requested approval, because you can't do anything in that cult unless it's approved by Ranjita, Nityananda's sex partner in the scandal videos who is now like his right-hand person, Unless she gives you approval, you can't do anything. So when Jasmine Glow sent a request for approval to build a similar stage with the pieces available in Slovakia, it was denied. And she was told, follow that instruction, take responsibility for it, make it happen. So in real life, taking responsibility is something realistic. You know, if you drive past the scene of a crime or the scene of a crash site on the road, and there are no first response vehicles. Say you're the first person on the scene, nobody else saw the accident take place. Responsibility means what? Dialing 911, calling for emergency roadside help, checking to make sure the people involved in the crash are okay. That's responsibility. Just being a caring, compassionate citizen in the world, being a good human being is taking responsibility for your life and for the lives of other people. In his cult, he doesn't give a shit about anybody else but himself. So he will overwork, overburden, overload anyone who has surrendered to him. And he tells them it is their responsibility to make his vision into a reality. And personally, I believe that the reason he gives people impossible tasks, for example, for me, he told me bring 10,000 people 
to the December 2017 Maha Sadashivoham program. I personally believe he gives these kinds of impossible tasks so that if and when he chooses to be a dick towards us, you know, to be mean, to yell at us, to punish us, to tell other people that we're failures, he can say, I told her clearly do this and she failed her responsibility, so she's a failure. He, he gets off somehow on putting other people down. It's like that classic bully mentality where any school teacher can tell you the reason some kids are bullies is to make themselves feel better about themselves. Nityananda is a bully and he uses the loaded language word responsibility in order to bully other people and make them feel like failures. Now last of these four tatwas is enriching and like I said each of us has something creative about ourselves that we use to enrich the world. Comedians enrich others through laughter. Chefs enrich others through flavor and nutrition. Doctors enrich others by making them healthy, by curing their diseases. You know, whatever chosen profession you have or whatever chosen expression you have, you've chosen that in a way to contribute something that makes the world a better place for others enriching. The way that word is used in the cult of Nityananda is only and exclusively used as far as introducing other people to Nityananda. We've all heard of Mormons on their mission who come two by two and knock on our doors saying, can I tell you about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? That would be their form of enriching. The Nityananda form of enriching making YouTube videos about him, making Facebook posts about him, tweeting about him, calling up your friends and inviting them to come to his center to experience one of his free meditations, wearing the mala, that necklace with his picture on it everywhere you go and telling everybody about him. In his loaded language definition, enriching means sharing him with the world. Now, anything else you do, and this was literally told to me by multiple people within his cult, his insiders or his personal team, anything you do in life is a time waste, a waste of time. It is useless if it's not leading others to him. So things that I used to love to do, like abstract art, like making jewelry, like, you know, promoting veganism, those things were considered useless wastes of time unless I could somehow skew them in the direction of leading people to Nityananda. Now, I was such a good, subservient, surrendered disciple that I stopped doing all the things I liked. I stopped contributing to the world the way I felt was enriching to others. I stopped doing the tarot cards I used to really enjoy reading because I believed the only way I could enrich the world was by leading people to him. And sadly, there are you know, lots of people in the world right now who consider themselves part of the Nityananda Sangha who are completely ignoring their own authentic expressions because their authenticity is centered on him. They are foregoing their integrity to themselves and to their families and to their friends and to their bosses and to their employees because their integrity, again, is centered on him. They're not being responsible for their worldview or for, for their personal choice in life or for the people around them or for their lives because their top priority is responsibility to his impossible instructions and Potemkin village of a mission. Uh, and they are not living with the spirit of enriching themselves and enriching others in a genuine way they consider enriching to be giving out his brochures, you know, sharing his Facebook posts, talking about his discourses. Their entire air they breathe, A-I-R-E, authenticity, integrity, responsibility, and enriching, is whitewashing their true self-sovereignty and painting it over with the mask of their false guru, their fraud guru. Now, why am I so hard on him? Why do I say that it's a Potemkin village of a mission? I say that because 
on the surface. You look at his website or his YouTube channel and you see these smiling, happy faces of disciples. But I have physically been there and I know from personal experience, those people are only putting on a smile for the camera. Behind the scenes, he is yelling at them incessantly, calling them donkeys, calling them buffaloes, calling them idiots, calling them fools calling them third-rate bloody dogs. He is barking at them. He is growling at them. He is instructing them to beat each other. He shows as if he feeds them well, but behind the scenes, he tells them they don't deserve to eat unless they take responsibility for his mission. Oh, they're all sleep deprived. It's just, it's just a hellish experience living in his organization. And so he tells the world that he is the embodiment of eternal bliss, Nityananda, but he is driving his disciples to depression. And then he cries persecution when people like me share our experiences and say, hey, I lived with him for years. He was a jerk. He was a tyrant. He's a narcissist. He calls us abusive, which is the complete polar opposite. Again, it's a loaded language. He abuses people. He instructed his Gurukul students to beat each other until they bleed or they cry. He abused those kids through corporal punishment. He blamed them for the failure of his Mahasadashi Goham program. When paid participants weren't manifesting the third eye superpowers he promised them, instead of taking responsibility for everything happening around him, he shirked that responsibility and blamed it on his innocent children, the students of his school, and told them it was their fault. He does not practice what he preaches. So here's another ironic thing. He makes other people agree to integrity, authenticity, responsibility, and enriching in the name of him. But he himself is late for sessions. He skips sessions. God, if I had a dollar for every time I had to stand on his damn stage with a microphone in my hand, blabbering on like an idiot because I was told, speak for 10 minutes and then Nityananda is going to be here for satsang. And then after 10 minutes, I look down at my friends, usually Manyanatma in the tech pit, and she'd be holding up a sign and motioning me, keep talking, keep talking, because he slept through his own discourse. I would be a wealthy woman. In any case, the loaded language in his teaching is constantly to make people drop their old identities and pick up his. Now, I understand there is a sacredness to the sannyasa tradition. There is something beautiful about brahmacharyam when people choose to practice it and they do so in an authentic spiritual community. I have nothing but love and reverence for Hinduism and for its great tradition and its great practices. But the way he was promoting it, the way he was saying one thing on stage and doing something opposite behind the scenes, it cannot lead people to enlightenment. So I'm getting a little bit annoyed with people constantly asking me, aren't you grateful for some of the things he gave you? Because no, all he gave me was the exact antithesis of what he had promised. He promised eternal bliss. He promised a lifestyle of enlightenment. He promised to revive the Vedagamic civilization. But instead, what he gave us was depression and confusion and a misunderstanding of identity. See, sannyasa should mean going beyond sexual desires, going beyond physical attachments, going beyond worldly possessions. Instead, he instructed me, wear a full face of makeup every day and don't leave my room without it. Now, I still enjoy makeup for self-expression and I put it on for my videos, but when I go to the post office or the grocery store or for a walk around the lake, I do it bare-faced because I feel like it and that's my choice. How is it going beyond identity to be given the instruction wear makeup all the frickin' time? He made us collect jewelry. He See, the sannyas robes, those saffron robes worn by a renunciant, are to go beyond attachment to material things. Conceptually, that should work. But he made us have, say, like 10 to 15 sets of different clothes, each tailored in a different way so they looked beautiful. He told me to look at Bollywood movies and take my orange cloth to a tailor and get it cut in those styles. He is only like a plastic version of Hinduism. In fact, he is the anti-Hindu element because 
in the glorious name of Hinduism, what he is actually living is materialism and overdriven sexuality. He's a predator who sexualizes men, women, and also children. And like I said, I hope other victims will start coming forward soon because then I think the public will start opening their eyes a little bit more. He is like the Epstein of the spiritual world and he needs to be stopped. And Ranjita is like his Ghislaine Maxwell. She's like the woman who's enabling it and bringing him victims and yelling at people if they don't surrender to him enough. It's a really sick culture. So anyhow, now I can say with authenticity, integrity, responsibility, and exposing, instead of constantly promoting his organization, I will keep exposing the crimes that he's committed and the cost to the human lives of the people who have surrendered themselves to him. And I am going to keep doing more and more videos interviewing other people who have escaped that cult. Because in my case, when I first decided to get out of the Nityananda cult, I would binge watch Leah Remini and Chris Shelton and Ron Miscavige and other ex-Scientologists who escaped Scientology. And I was watching TED Talks by people who got out of the FLDS church and people who got out of um, Watchtower, the Jehovah's Witnesses. I found it extremely empowering to hear the stories of people who lived in a mind-controlled state, in a cultic group with the constant overriding pressure to deny their identities and to become compliant members of a cultic destructive organization. I found it really inspiring that, well, damn, if they can do it, if they can get healthy again and move on with their lives, then so can I. And I know that as Nityananda self-destructs, people who are trapped living in his organization are also going to start looking for examples of others who got through it and who moved on with their lives healthily. And I would love to keep providing that. So for those of you who enjoy those videos, I'm so glad you're enjoying it. And for those who are benefiting from them and taking your identities back and rediscovering authenticity to yourself and integrity to yourself and responsibility to yourself and what you want to enrich yourself and others with, more power to you and I'm always here for you on your journey. And maybe the last thing I want to end this video with is that I still do cherish a lot of the same beliefs I cherished before I found Nityananda. Now I can say I've gone kind of into an agnostic phase where I still definitely believe in divinity. I still definitely believe that there is an organized order to existence, that it's a, a beautiful expression. I believe overwhelmingly that positivity will always come out on top. That any negative experiences I've lived, I can transmute those into something positive. It's not like I spend every day dwelling on thoughts of Nityananda and bad memories of being yelled at by him thinking, that fucker, I want to destroy him. I'm not like a negative person dwelling on the past. I spend most of my days painting, making jewelry, playing with my cats, going for walks, reconnecting with my family, you know, inventing new vegan recipes, playing with gemstones. I love life now more than I ever loved it before. And I kind of think of, you know, this entity on YouTube called Bashar. I don't know whether he's real or not, and I don't care at this point because I'm not going to, you know, believe in anything for the sake of believing in it. But one of the quotes I saw of his in a video a long, long time ago, he described something that he called the rubber band theory, which is like the farther back you pull a rubber band, when you let it go, it's going to fly that much farther forward. And he said, the, the more negative an experience you've had in your life might be, the greater your joy is going to be when you come out of that negativity, like pulling back the rubber band and then you fly forward. I kind of feel like, an experience of so-called spirituality could not be worse. Like the greatest, horrible, sad, deprived, restrictive, negative thing that you can experience as a seeker is getting sucked into a destructive cult and denying your own 
self-sovereignty to serve the agenda of a greedy narcissist. That's like the worst spiritual thing that can happen to your soul. Having gone into that kind of negativity, it's like sunsets are more beautiful now that I can sit and enjoy them because I once lived in a place where I couldn't go outside at sunset because I had to make a hundred freaking telemarketer type causing calls to make people pay for a program. It's like salad, fresh salad tastes so much more delicious because I lived in a place where months and months would go by where we wouldn't get any raw vegetables. It's like, I don't sit and think, damn it, my life got ruined by that place. I, it's more like now I appreciate all the things that were deprived to me at that time. And it's like, I've got a greater appreciation for life. I will never take my cats for granted after living with somebody who denied us the right to love pets. And, you know, I, I think that again, going back to something I said earlier in this video, if we feel like everything bad that happened to us is our fault, we're never going to be able to heal and move on because instead of taking responsibility for the outcome of the event, we're trapped in this guilt that we made that event happen to us or we gave permission to be violated. Now I feel if anyone tells you you cannot be violated, that individual is definitely violating you. Nityananda violated the self-sovereignty and the critical thinking of his disciples by cunningly telling them they cannot be violated so they wouldn't be able to attribute all of the things he did to impede their freedom to him. He also would say choices aren't freedom. If you have to decide what to wear every day, what to eat every day, what to do every day, who to talk to every day, what to live for every day, then you'll be so overwhelmed with those choices that you'll never experience the inner freedom of oneness with existence. Okay, conceptually I can see why people might believe that. And you know, some people might really love to have a uniform they wear every day and a set meal plan for what to eat every day and a set schedule what to do every day. And okay, maybe that will give them more freedom to you know, decide their inner space. But the way choices were taken away from people in his cult, he would tell us where to live, when and when not to sleep, when and when not to eat, what to eat, what not to eat. People became so bogged down with trying to do everything he instructed that his removal of their choices did not give them more inner freedom. It re the lack of choices became the lack of freedom. And so anybody who tells you you cannot be violated is violating you. Anybody who tells you that your choices in life are not freedom is definitely taking your freedom away. So I hope this clears up some of those questions. I still do yoga, but I did that before I found him, so I can't say that I attribute that to him. And I really, to be honest, no longer follow any of his teachings. And so if you have any more questions about that, you're welcome to leave them as comments below and check out my Etsy shop. I haven't said that in so many videos, but I've been wearing one of my favorite pairs of earrings that has the Sri Chakra symbol. I still love symbology. Like I said, I'm more agnostic than religious now, but I do feel that there is something beneficial in wearing the symbols that remind us of our higher goals in life. So yeah, being balanced with divinity, that is still one of my goals. So why not wear something that symbolizes that? I still wear a lot of crystals. I've got aquamarine and garnet today, partly because I just think they're beautiful. And I don't know whether crystals actually have energy or not, but I do think it's kind of a fun idea and a fun way to incorporate something that symbolically represents my goals. Like aquamarine is said by crystal healers to empower the throat chakra and the capacity to speak clearly. So whether or not it really does that, if you believe it does that, the placebo effect will have a positive you know, positive power on you. So why not go for it? Have fun with things like that. So I'm not really a hardcore believer in any specific spiritual thing at the moment, but I still like crystals and so I'll still make crystal jewelry and I still like Hindu symbols, so I'll still use them in my art. And yeah, I hope that kind of clears things up. So once again, thank you for tuning in. I'll end this long winded kind of talk and we'll see you in the next video. Bye.